Welcome everybody back. I'm so glad that you're joining us for this next session, Identity and Inspiration. What do we know about basic scientists? But before we get, begin, I'm gonna go over just a couple of housekeeping rules. First, you can now submit questions privately or publicly. Um, when you go to the Q&A box, there's a little check box at the bottom left-hand corner. You can, should be able to uncheck it. It should no longer be grayed out. If it is grayed out, try refreshing your uh, screen. Next, closed captions are being done by a live captioner. You can click on the show caption box under the center stage, stage screen to see them. And if you need help for direct messaging or help desk instructions, those instructions are in the lobby feed, which is out of the center stage, but we will drop them again in the chat here in case you need help with the broadcast or um, seeing, you know, or being able to submit questions or anything like that. So without that, we're going to begin our session. So we know it's important and useful to understand what motivates scientists to communicate um, and engage and for them to develop clear goals so they can communicate more effectively. And one of the things we wondered at FIPEP and elsewhere is if scientists who identify their work or research as more basic or more fundamental, I saw some conversation earlier about what term to use there, um, have different goals from scientists who do research that's likely to have near-term applications, and if they favor some goals more than others. Um, so we connected with experts to work to understand scientists' motivations and goals, either in their research or for their communication programs. And so the purpose of the session is to unpack all of this, dig in a little bit deeper. So the first thing, I'm going to invite Chris Volpe, who was in our previous session, to give us a short overview, and then we will move on. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Keegan. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Volpe, Executive Director of Science Council. I had the pleasure of speaking at the previous session and dropping a little bit of a bomb on some folks who haven't heard this before when I said that the majority of the public identify a uh, feeling of hope when it comes to science. And uh, in, in my experience, about a third of, uh, of scientists throw up their arms and say, hallelujah, that's right. A third are personally offended by associating the word hope and science together, and then a third are confused. So I'm going to sort of build that out. And if you are among those who find the association of hope and science um, uh, distasteful, to say the least, uh, this session is for you because uh, you basically have a little bit more work to do in terms of connecting with the public uh, based on your initial frame of reference for science. So let me go ahead and share some data. So this is a sort of a strategic level science communication uh, presentation. Uh, we're gonna look at some differences that seem to be uh, apparent with process versus payoff minded views of science. Again, in the last session, uh, I, uh, I, I shared that, um, that the majority of Americans associate science with hope. That is not the case with scientists, hence the gap. That's the short version. Um, and when we discovered at Science Counts, you know, the fact that the brand, if you will, that there's this strong association of science and hope with the public, the word hope didn't even appear in the survey instrument that we used to reach that conclusion. We reached it how you do lots of branding analysis for those of you who are marketers. You ask a lot of questions about a lot of stuff and then you synthesize. But since that initial report, uh, at least six times, four by us and two by other organizations, they've asked a very simple question in surveys to the public, which is which word best describes uh, what you feel, not think, but feel when you hear the word science. It's a multiple choice question with a write in. And here's one example, 2019. And you can see that uh, the majority, a little slim majority, but a majority of Americans associate uh, their feelings with hope. Um, in the previous session, there was a person who, uh, who shared that they're in a community where that's not really the case. And that's, that's certainly, uh, that exists out there because you'll see that 16% of Americans as of 2019 you know, view the word science, they feel caution. They're not sure. They're uh, they're doubtful. Um, they're you know. So so there's there's a little bit of variety there. Well, in 2019, uh, myself and some of the other folks here in this session, uh, Bessley Dudo uh, Newman 
and the Allen Alda Center for Communicating Science decided to ask the same question to research scientists at top universities to see what we get. And what we found was that the prevalent response was not hope, but was joy. Although a third of the scientists answering the survey did identify the feeling of hope as their number one feeling, which is very interesting. Okay, so it got us thinking, we said, okay, first of all, uh, you know, we've got uh, a bunch of scientists who associates hope, and then a bunch of scientists who associate joy, and then everything else was a distant third. I won't worry about that at the moment. You know, is there any distinguishing feature between the hope scientists and the joy scientists based on some other parameter, characteristic, demographic? You know, are young scientists more hopeful than senior scientists, or is it the other way around, et cetera? We began to probe. Now, uh, the conjecture that we that we had and that I had here, um, so I'll take the blame if this proves to be wrong, is, you know, the word hope, if you look it up in the dictionary, it's kind of a clue. It's the expectation of a future outcome. Uh, and so, you know, we are emotional beings, despite what people say. Um, human beings are emotional beings that think. We're not the other way around. You know, that we want some kind of positive emotional return in our existence. And people who hope for stuff are anticipating a future emotional positive return. So hope means you're looking downrange, you're looking towards the future, okay? And so we know in science, what that translates into is the fact that the science is a journey that's hopefully going to lead to an eventual payoff or a return. So the conjecture is the people who are hope oriented are payoff minded. They're looking at the eventual success. In contrast, people and scientists who are joy oriented well joy means i'm getting my positive emotional return in the present uh, so that means i'm focusing on the here and now and as all of us who do science know uh, you don't have successes every day if you're a research scientist in fact most days uh, you have no uh, successes and sometimes you go backwards so if you're experiencing joy in the everyday of doing your work, it must not be hinged to the actual concrete results because you don't have those every day, but you enjoy the actual process, the act of doing science, the inquiry and the exploration. And so the conjecture is, okay, if you're a joy person, that might be a clue that you're a little bit more into the process of science than the payoff of science. So what we did was um, we wanted to take a closer look at this distinction between hope public and scientists, and joy public and scientists. And so we created, in essence, a phase diagram with, with hope um, or payoff along the x-axis and joy excitement, uh, in other words, process on the y-axis, and just plot these out. And we did this. First of all, you can see that in terms of as groups, scientists and public lie in different places on this phase diagram. No kidding. Uh, we have to work in often to connect with the public on issues of science. But we really did this because we wanted to look at the red dot more closely and see if there are different clusters of scientists that are either closer or further away than the public dot. So what we did was we looked at the data from the scientists and we broke it out based on various uh, factors. So first we looked at segmenting, uh, segmenting scientists by their ideology, which yielded no result. Basically, all the dots that came out were sitting right in the same place they started. Uh, so there was no difference based on political ideology. Then we looked at um, segmentation by career level. Again, maybe younger scientists or early career scientists are more hopeful, or maybe they're less hopeful than senior. And the answer was there was no difference. Okay, basically everybody sat in the same place. Well, then we looked at sector because we also had some other data from a second part of the survey from private sector scientists government scientists scientists who work at philanthropies and again there was no real distinction or divergence when you broke up scientists in subgroups than what you see on the red dot and then really just as a lark because we're just running out of parameters we decided to see hmm let's break scientists up based on their field of study their scientific discipline and then we got this. And this was a complete surprise. Um, scientists, based on their discipline, moved all over the place. Where you have physicists way up, 
in the process-oriented joy part of this spectrum, if you will, or phase space. And then you have social scientists and engineers down at the bottom. Uh, and that was intriguing. Um, and like I said, we had a second data set um, that wasn't quite as robust as the scientist data set, but it, when you worked it up the same way, you got a similar result. So it, it sort of got us over the speed bump where we said, we don't think this is arbitrary or random. There's something real going on here. And as we were contemplating this in 2019, you know, trying to think, why could this be? One suggestion that came up was maybe this is an artifact of the ratio or proportion of basic scientific research versus applied scientific research that goes on in each of these disciplines, meaning physicists tend to do more basic oriented research where social scientists, engineers do more applied. And maybe that's what's bleeding through here. But we didn't know. Well, fortunately for us, um, Todd Newman, Nicole Levy went back and uh, they did another experiment in 2019, another survey uh, of top scientists, academic scientists, and they reproduced this. Um, this is real. Okay, so in 2021, you can see that contrasting with the 2019 data. Again, physicists are sort of at one end of the spectrum. Social scientists are at the other. And I'm jesting with the title of this slide where, you know, anything where, you, where, where it sorts physicists end up on one side of the room and social scientists on the other must be sorting something that's real, right? Because they rarely uh, share the same space. Um, but this is, this is fascinating. And one thing that's interesting to note is that in 2021, we were in the middle of COVID. And so if you look at this, you'll notice that the joy metric for every group dropped. Uh, evidently, on average, about 10%, it was less joyful or exciting to do science in the middle of COVID than it was in 2019, which is kind of just an interesting anecdote. And then finally, I want to sort of share that fortunately for us, um, Todd and Nicole added a question in their 2021 survey, which basically asked, what type of research do you do? Is it predominantly basic? Is it predominantly applied? Or is it a mix of both? And when you partition out the scientists based on those response and put it on our hope joy diagram, you find that in fact, those who are primarily basic do live further up into the left, more into this, uh, let's call it process minded space. And those who I, it responded, they most of their work is applied are definitely more to the lower right. So they're more in this uh, payoff minded area. And so I think, in fact, this is what's driving a lot of that distinction. And so this is incredibly relevant for this conference and our conversation, because what it's saying is scientists who tend to focus on basic research tend to be more uh, process minded when it comes to science. Um, those who are applied are more payoff minded. And we know that the public is not universal, but the majority of the public is definitely more payoff minded. And so for those of us who are process minded, we have an extra hurdle to get over as we're building this bridge with the public in terms of communication. And what it also means, and I hate to say this, but I'll be blunt. It means that if you're a process minded scientist, your intuition in terms of the decisions you make, in terms of how best to communicate with a payoff-minded audience, are going to mislead you. Um, they're going to take you down the wrong path. And so that's where things like training and additional data are really valuable. For those of us who are process-minded, we tend to focus on the how uh, in terms of answering questions and how we do our work, where those who are more payoff-minded tend to focus on the what and often the why. So... That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Chris. And now I'm going to invite Olivia to join us with her perspective on this basic scientist versus applied scientist swap. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. And I'll have to apologize. I'm having a few technical difficulties where I cannot see the chat, even without sharing slides. Apparently, I'm no longer authorized, but I hope that everyone will be able to see me sharing slides. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about my perception of scientists in these basic and applied areas. And just as an introduction, I run AG's Sharing Science program, and that's um, a way through the American Geophysical Union to support scientists in communicating effectively 
memorably and in building dialogue with wider audiences in a lot of different ways. And one of the main ways in which I'm interacting with scientists fairly regularly is through workshops that we offer, both in person and these days mostly virtually, although there are other realms as well. And you don't really need to pay attention to the workshop demographics per se. Um, I'd say mostly it is composed of people who, now that I'm in my 40s, I refer to as young people. So grad students and those earlier in their career. And then the majority of other people are either scientific researchers or other academics of some kind. And by and large, this is a lot of people whose, whose primary career is in basic science rather than applied science. And we ask people when they register for workshops what they most want to learn about communicating science. And you know this varies a lot, but we get a lot of things about how can I be relevant? How can I be simple and clear and interesting? How do I deal with topics that might be more politicized or inflammatory? How do I bridge disconnects? And we also ask this question, what's the question you're kind of afraid of getting or feel is especially difficult? And these also range a gamut, um, often things related to misinformation or potentially hostile questions. But I'd say that a lot of it boils down to um, scientists really wanting to say, how can I help me answer the questions? What do you do? Why should I care? Why should I believe you? And what can I do about it? And we try to address these things. And I'm going to give some impressions and then sort of immediately contradict myself about them. Um, I would say that there is some, to some degree, those who are in basic science uh, have less experience with certain information and skills and are so very receptive to learning them. So if we're talking about relevance, which I know is a whole category that has a lot of details, um, and nuances that we could discuss. But if it's about how do I connect my science in a way that's relevant to whatever audience it is, or how much jargon is too much jargon, things like that. Um, those with a basic research background can also sometimes be less aware, and again, I'm including a lot of caveats there, of certain other, what I think are fundamentals around understanding science communication and how to do it. For example, we talk a lot about the reasons that there's skepticism around science or scientists or certain areas of science. And one of them is about the politicization of a lot of areas of science, right? Uh, climate change, vaccines, evolution, etc. So that if you're coming in somewhere, people may feel that what you are presenting is an attack on their values. But there's also a lot of skepticism around science because Let's face it, science has been used for a very long time to disenfranchise a lot of people. So if scientists come in with the sort of disingenuous attitude of science is always for everybody and it's great for everyone with no caveats and nuances, then that's certainly not going to help build trust. It's going to only uh, increase skepticism. Now, I've said, oh, I notice this about basic scientists more than applied. But for me, I am I have to ask myself if it's really about sort of the way that scientists think about science and therefore how they approach wanting to communicate, or if it's about the fact that by and large, basic scientists have less experience interacting on a regular frequent basis with non-scientists. Right? So it may be more about what kind of experience level people have as to where they are on the spectrum rather than because they're in basic or applied fields. It's a question I ask myself. Also, scientists' identities matter. When it comes to everything from knowing that you need to be more clear and that jargon is actually something that can be really off-putting to the fact that objectivity is a social construct and uh, humanizing science and representation in science matters. Well, if scientists themselves come from groups that have been historically excluded from science and power in general, so people who are non-white, people who are not cisgender, people who are not straight, not male, all of these things, it's a lot easier to recognize. They're, you know, they're already much further along in knowing these things. So, you know, big surprise. Uh, life experience and background and social identity also informs how scientists themselves are approaching science communication 
and where their perspectives are on how to interact with audiences to begin with. And then also, the types of messages matter, right? So when we talk about how we're helping scientists communicate science, part of it has to do with what they want to communicate to whom. So if we're talking about science in terms of inspiring a sense of wonder and discovery and awe and astonishment and pushing barriers and learning new things about ourselves and the universe and so on, that's one category. And then another large category is this um, being able to communicate about the relevance of science, right? How it ties into larger societal issues or human endeavors or dimensions or health or what have you. And scientists from both basic and applied backgrounds may want to communicate either of these. And so they may each have a bit of an edge, I would argue, in one or the other based on where they're coming from. So, you know, my, my own impressions after years and years, about 12 years doing this kind of work, um, as to how important that distinction is when we're talking about how we support scientists in doing science communication and how we give them skills. I, I think basic and applied is one distinction. I think it's dangerous if we try to make it the largest distinction or the one that means most, or if it means that we ignore all of these other aspects of identity and purpose that are also going to inform how scientists communicate. Uh, and with that, I will conclude and stop my time. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Olivia. And now we're going to have a series of presentations by John Besley, Sarah Yo, and Todd Newman on some of the work that they've been doing to understand the identity and motivations and goals of basic scientists. So I would like to welcome Sarah Yo first. Thank you, Keegan. It's really great to be here. I um, appreciate this opportunity to share some data with you that I've collected on uh, scientists as part of a separate project. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Great, so um, I'm Sarah Yeo. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Utah, uh, and I'm a science of science communication researcher. Uh, so as part of an NSF funded project on using humor to communicate science, my collaborators and I conducted a survey of um, scientists at research, high research universities in the US. And most of the questions are about social media with some on humor given the goals of the project. Uh, we had some criteria for exclusion, so let me tell you a little bit about the sample here. Um, so we had some criteria for exclusion because, as you can imagine, uh, scientists, right, the population of scientists at R1 universities in the United States is quite large. So, for example, we excluded scientists from professional units such as medical schools or veterinary sciences. Um, and I've included and shown some dem demographics on this slide so you can get a sense of the makeup of the sample. Uh, I sort of anticipate maybe having a question about how representative the sample is. Uh, so I compared it with some uh, AAUP data from 2020. Uh, so about 47.6% of tenure track faculty are female according to those AAUP uh, data. And so female scientists are underrepresented in our sample. Um, our sample is about 70% white, 90% are tenured, and 81.5% are from a public institution. So I will say, uh, while the Hispanic uh, percentage of Hispanic scientists in our sample is quite close and approximately matches that of some 2020 data, uh, Black and African American scientists are underrepresented in this sample. And so, um, we asked scientists first to categorize their research on a scale that ranged from mostly basic science to mostly applied science. And so um, it was a seven point scale. And we asked in terms of basic and applied research, how would you characterize right, how, your own research? And so what I'm showing here uh, is a distribution of scientists' responses to that question. About 
1,300 of the 1,600 scientists we sampled responded, and we see that many consider their research to be equal parts basic and applied. Um, that's certainly the highest frequency there. And then the next largest response was mostly basic. And so what I then did was I used this uh, to categorize scientists uh, into three categories based on what their responses were. So we had a mostly basic category, an equal parts, basic and applied, and then a mostly applied um, category. And this will come into play later, and I'll, and I'll talk about a few other questions leading up to that. So then we also asked scientists their thoughts on how acceptable it is to use social media to communicate with public audiences. Um, and you can see that most of them agree with this statement. Um, I also then looked at whether scientists' agreement with this statement differed by how they characterize their research. Um, and what I found was that there was no differences between groups, right? The, the sort of average score for each of these groups that I've divided the scientists into um, was, you know, about 5.6 to 5.7 on the seven-point scale. Um, and then we looked at scientists' perceived effectiveness of using social media for engaging publics. So that's the first one there on the left, 5.05, um, to inform public audiences and then also to demonstrate trustworthiness. All of these were measured on seven point scales. Um, and as you can see from the graph, the average score on each of these was over the midpoint. Right. And then I compared each of these perceived effectiveness across the three groups, mostly basic, mostly applied, and equal parts. Um, and so looking first at sort of the perceived effectiveness of social media for engaging audiences, um, what we find is that there is a significant difference between the average scores right, of each of the groups who identified as more basic, more applied, and equal parts. So scientists who identified uh, their research as more applied rated the effectiveness of social media at engaging audiences as higher on average compared um, to the other groups. So this trend also held for when it came to sort of the effectiveness uh, of, of social media at informing publics. You see the same patterns here. We see higher uh, scores among scientists who, who identify their research as, as more applied. And then similarly with demonstrating trustworthiness uh, among scientists, again, more applied sciences, higher scores. And finally, we also asked scientists um, about their own self-efficacy when it comes to communicating using social media. We asked them to rate the statement, I am skilled at communicating using social media, again, on a seven point Likert scale. Um, strongly disagree, strongly agree. And again, I found significant differences between groups of scientists who identified as more basic, more applied, or equal parts of those. Um, specifically, scientists who were in the more mostly basic research group scored significantly lower on this compared to the other two groups, um, which possibly shines some light on the need for more training in some way. Um, I'm going to go ahead and my time here uh, to my other colleagues, John Besley and Todd Newman, who also have data and allow them then to share some of their information here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I am going to invite Todd. Come join us. Great. Thank you so much, Keegan. And hello, everyone. Let me just uh get my screen share set up. All right, Everyone, hopefully. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Keegan, for uh, putting this uh, panel together. And I'm uh, really excited to be here. Uh, pres I'm presenting some work that I did uh, with two graduate students at uh, uh, UW-Madison in the Department of Life Sciences Communication, Ashley Kate and Lindsay Middleton. And uh, as Chris alluded to earlier, uh, this is part of the AAU survey uh, data collection uh, that many of the, the panelists have collectively uh, worked on. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we find in terms of uh, how scientists who see their research as more basic versus scientists who see their research as more applied and how that relates to different goals and objectives uh, for communication engagement. 
And so just to give you an overview of the demographics of the survey, um, as, as Sarah uh, alluded to in her, uh, in her study, uh, you know, in our sample, it was overwhelmingly male, uh, more senior, and tended uh, to be from more of the bio biological and medical sciences, as you can see here. Uh, this was a, a, a this was a um, that we conducted, uh, basically scraping uh, information, uh, email addresses, et cetera, uh, of different faculty and researchers at different AAU affiliated uh, universities. So. We asked in this survey about scientists' uh, goals and objectives, and uh, you know this is research John and Anthony have been working on. Um, I've worked on them uh, with this as well, with them as well. And uh, you can see here the eight different goals that we asked uh, scientists to uh, to basically identify. You know how much they prioritize on a sliding scale from zero to a hundred, and then different objectives. Uh, again, on a sliding scale from zero to 100. And you can see the mean scores across the different goals and the different objectives. And you can see, uh, you know, where uh, some interesting uh, some interesting differences emerge. For example, objective seven, hearing what others think about scientific, scientific issues across all scientists rank quite lowly compared to helping to inform people about scientific issues. We consistently see that is uh, the most prioritized uh, objective compared to others in uh, the studies that we've done. So what was unique about this survey is we included uh, this question largely from uh, the momentum that uh, Brooke and Keegan and uh, Rick at forming SciPEP have been thinking about this basic uh, versus applied distinction. And we created this, uh, this measure of asking scientists in the last five years, what amount of their research focused on addressing either basic science research questions or applied science research questions. And so they had a, a Likert scale going from never to a great deal, one to five, and respondents had these uh, two different questions that they, uh, that they got. And so I want to show you now just, just some correlations just with, in terms of uh, the basic science research, uh, how that correlates with different goals and objectives, as well as the applied science. And uh, I think you'll see some uh, interesting, uh, some interesting uh, correlations. So the first are the goals. And I've, uh, I've put asterisks around those that have significant differences. And you can see uh, one column is on the basic scale. So the higher that is, uh, the more basic science one does. So positive correlation, in the, stronger positive correlation indicates that's more prioritized, whereas uh, negative, um, the opposite. And you can see with some of these, uh, you know, the, the, the correlations aren't, aren't, aren't that large, but you can see where some significant differences emerge. For example, the second to last, ensuring scientists ask questions that benefit society, that is something that was much that was prioritized much more among applied scientists than it was among basic scientists. You can get a sense of looking at this about some of those other differences that emerge as well. When it comes to objectives, uh, we also saw some differences between basic and applied. Uh, for example, getting people interested or excited about science. Um, you can see basic scientists are much more likely to prioritize this versus applied scientists not as likely to prioritize this relative to others. Um, and again, we also see that many of these, uh, both goals and objectives, there were no significant differences or correlations when it came to uh, using these two measures independently. So what we did uh, in order to analyze this a bit further is similar to what Sarah was uh, discussing. We tried to create some kind of uh, conceptual groupings. And a lot of this uh, insight was kind of drawn from uh, 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 a prospectus that, that Brooke wrote, kind of thinking about the pastoralist quadrant, and how can we group these different individuals, uh, these different scientists, based on how they score on basic science and how they score in terms of the basic science that they do, as well as the applied science. And so, uh, on the far left, you can see that you know, 22% of the sample are essentially researchers who indicate their most of the research they do is highly basic, so four or five on the scale. Again, I'm just putting down there what the question is that we use. And, you know, don't consider their research uh, applied, right? So score very lowly. And then as you move from the left to the right, um, uh, the next one, high, the high basic, medium uh, applied, high basic, high applied, medium basic, high applied, low basic, high applied, right? So the low basic, high applied would be those individuals individual scientists who, thinks that, who think that their research is highly applied and not so much basic. 
And you can see the breakdowns here. And interesting to note is you can you also notice that 44% of the sample came into this high basic, high applied category across all the different fields, which is similar to the um, kind of distribution that Sarah just showed earlier, showing some overlap with that. I also want to note uh, why these categories matter. So this is just looking at two uh, of these uh, specific uh, fields, which is engineering and uh, physics and astronomy. And you can see that for engineering, the majority, uh, something close to close to 70 percent, indicate uh, that they re they identify the research as high basic and high applied, where a field like physics and astronomy is much more uh, sees their research as much more basic and less applied. And so what we decided to do was, uh, and I'm not going to show the, the full model, but we wanted to, to model this a little bit to see if we were to compare the, the scientists who consider their research highly basic and low applied to these other groups across the different goals and objectives that I just uh, I went over previously and control for some factors such as uh, gender, career level, uh, the university size, um, have they received any type of communication training and seeing if there's any significant differences that emerge in terms of scientists who think of their research as more uh, basic uh, versus scientists who see their research as more uh, applied. And what we find uh, through this model is that where the, 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 significance, uh, the significant, uh, uh, significance emerges is that basic scientists prioritize much more, uh, prioritize uh, these types of engagements and objectives these goals and objectives much more than applied researchers is getting young people to choose scientific careers, as well as generating interest and excitement about science. So this follows a lot of what Chris uh, presented earlier in terms of the process minded, uh, right? Getting people to choose scientific careers, the joy and excitement of science, generating interest and excitement about science. Where we see the opposite in terms of where uh, those who are more, have more, uh, do more applied research differ significantly from those that are more uh, basic comes to these two questions, hearing what others think about scientific issues and ensuring scientists ask questions that benefit society. Now, this isn't saying these scientists who are more basic don't prioritize these at all, but relative to applied scientists, applied scientists are much more likely to apply to, um, are much more likely to prioritize uh, these two. So we can begin to just see, I think from these last three talks, a little bit of the pattern that's emerging here in terms of motivations among different scientists. And so uh, that's where I'll stop and uh, appreciate your uh, attention. And I'm happy to share, uh, if anyone's interested in, 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 in the nuance of a lot of this, uh, the paper, um, if you would like to email me. So I'm going to stop my share. Great. Thank you so much, Todd. And now we will welcome John Besley. And John is already ready. Thank you. Welcome, John. All right. Just see if I got that set up okay. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, guys, for, for letting me share this. And there's going to be some stuff here that's, that's a little similar to um, what we've just heard from my colleagues. We've done a lot of this work together. Um, this, another person who's involved in a lot of this work is my colleague, Anthony Dudo. Um, some of the ideas that we're, we're going to talk about here come or sort of can be found in this book that came out less than a year ago that I hope some of you have seen and we'll touch back to. Let me just see if I can. And uh, yeah, and so one of the things in this is that, and I put this in the chat when Todd was speaking, just because there's a bit of a, sometimes we're a little picky when it comes to the language that we use. And one of the ways we're a little bit picky is this differentiation, but when we say goals, what do we really mean? We really mean audience specific behavioral goals. And we really differentiate that from what we would think as cognitive and affective obje objectives, which we colloquially call BFFs, which would be beliefs, feelings, and frames. And so that's, that's it's a big difference for us. And so what I'm gonna be really focused on today, and we're increasingly focused on how important it is to get that goal part right. And so I'm really gonna focus mostly on the goal part today. Um, often things that we talk about, things like hope, like for us, hope is an objective. If somebody said, my goal is hope, we'd say, well, but why do you want to, to, to spur hope or foster hope? If somebody said, well, I want to correct misinformation, we'd say, well, what do you want to correct misinformation about? And why do you want to correct misinformation? And so um, we'd really emphasize, try to really help our scientists that we work with identify, but if you did that thing, if you communicated that information and affected those perceptions or beliefs or feelings or frames, what do you hope would happen? And that really getting to that goal bit. And so we're really gonna focus in on that goal bit today. Um, and so we're gonna do it with some survey data. This is newer, survey, some new, relatively new survey data from 2022 that Cavalier asked us to, to collect. Um, and the thing that's different here is 
uh, we did a sample that's meant to be kind of, whereas like the, the Sarah showed data that was sort of people at both ends of the pole in terms of applied and, and, and basic, we kind of sort of put our thumb on the needle a little bit to try to get a sample that had quite a bit of basic science in it. And by which we meant, by which we mean that um, the, um, we, what we did is we surveyed in fields where we knew there was a, a high proportion of basic, of basic scientists. Um, and so, yeah, and so like it's pretty similar demographics to what Sarah showed. A lot of men, uh, people who identify as men, a lot of people who identify as white, fairly relatively old. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the demographics. Uh, in the end, um, we're dealing with, um, you know, about 1,800, 1,900 surveys. The, the number of respondents on any given question is less. The number of respondents in each subfield is going to be less. One really weird thing about this, and I don't get a lot into like significance, is that we just actually attempted to do an attempted uh, attempted census of the authors from recent years in these journals. So uh, it's not actually a sample in the traditional sense. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm mostly going to focus on some questions that SIPEP uh, asked us to answer. And so the first one is this, are, do science, basic scientists have goals that are different than other folks? And so I'm going to answer this in two ways, because remember I said, what I really care about is audience specific behavioral goals. Challenges like for any given behavior, you could have a range of audiences. And so we actually asked this question in two parts, who are your priority audiences and what are your priority goals? And so this first one's just for your audiences. Um, you can see that interestingly, and, and this is Keegan really wanted us to include internal leadership and we pushed back, but apparently the number one audience for a lot of scientists is their internal leadership. Then we get to youth and policymakers and media and broader public. And just to point out that there's a, there's a and I'm not, I actually am one of the people who doesn't think there's huge differences between um, basic and non and, apply, and, and applied scientists, and I'll talk a little bit why, but you can see maybe like uh, astrophysicists here um, lean a little bit on the youth thing. Maybe maybe the atmospheric scientists, for reasons we can all imagine, lean a little bit on the policymaker audience. But again, these are all high, right? This is a seven point scale. These guys are all relatively, these top ones are all relatively high. Um, interesting, the two physics groups we had in this, particle physicists and astrophysicists, both kind of um, were a little relatively low on the um, profession's private sector audiences, which makes sense uh, if you think about that, of those as being places where there would be a desire for, for applied goals. Uh, I, would just, I just want to put the last thing, the, the group that is least focused on um, prior, prior, least prioritized is the group that I think we should actually spend more time thinking about, which is um, uh, the group of values-based groups. So that would be conservatives, uh, religious groups, political groups, people who identify who really identify with a specific sort of point of view or group. Um, we don't spend a lot of time. We don't really prioritize those audiences, which I think is really interesting. Um, and then I'll talk about goals. Um, so this is a little bit different than the list of, of goals that Todd had because we sort of took the audience out of it. Um, in the past, when we, we've done lots of surveys now, we've probably surveyed 25, 30,000 scientists across a whole bunch of different projects. Um, almost always the number one goal we get is they want policymakers to consider scientific evidence. In this case, this is the generic version of that, which is increase, increase the likelihood that people consider um, scientific evidence. And if you go back, policymakers was a pretty high group. And so you could probably think that that's pretty consistent with um, other past surveys. In this case, the funding one actually came up pretty high relative to where it's come in past studies. So that's interesting, which makes sense from a basic science perspective. Building trust was really high. And really those top three or top three are pretty much dead heats, right? And they're all, again, all really high. Um, uh, let me just point out a couple specific things. Um, so we did a fun little, ex it's almost it's an experiment in this, which is, so those three, I would argue, are essentially the same goal. Uh, one is a little soft, the first one's a little softer, consider, we want people to consider scientific evidence in the context of a behavior. And the survey had some examples of what that really looked like. Um, and then the next one is like a little stronger, make people increase the likelihood people make decisions, not just consider evidence in the context of the decision, but make specific decisions. And then the last one's advocating. And it's interesting that just those little, little tweaks uh, definitely push them down the relative prioritization um, level. Uh, what else did I want to see? Oh, oh. And then uh, other big thing I want to point out, and one of the really important things that people sometimes misunderstand when we talk about strategic science communication, is they think that we mean that all goals have to be, I'm going to affect other people. But one of the things we try to be really clear about that we don't do a good job about is saying, no, you should have a goal as a scientist. Like I can say, yeah, I want you to consider scientific evidence, but my goal at the same time might be, I want to know if I can do better research, if I, have, if I can 
make better research decisions. Maybe how I do the research, maybe um, uh, um, what questions I ask, but I can have a goal, which is really what the idea of consultation is. I can always have a goal when I design communication where I'm trying to improve my choices, my choices about my research, my choices about how I communicate my research. Um, and we had this in sort of some blurb stuff that was with the question, but even still, uh, as we found in the past, that is the least important goal or the least prioritized goal uh, of scientists. And we're doing some more work trying to understand um, why that might be. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so that's the first question. So goals, um, big picture is scientists want to do more than foster hope. They want to actually affect the world. Um, you can see, yeah, entry the youth one actually is another one, interesting one to look at and that it's right in the middle, even though a lot of our um, SciComm stuff sort of defaults to youth audiences. Um, are there goals that are distinctive of basic scientists? No, nah, not really. I'm not gonna show you all the analysis we did that. This is just one example, just looking at sort of the um, correlations. Not really, just some little stuff, but nothing that I would make a big deal of. I would argue that, and I'll come back to this at the end, but I would argue that scientists have, basic scientists, applied scientists, everybody has things they want to affect in the real world. Another one, and this is a little, I'm gonna be a little bit tricky, a little caveat here, uh, what motivates scientists? We actually don't use the word motivation in our work. For us, motivation, there's a whole body of social science literature on motivation, um, self-determination theory gets into this idea of intrinsic versus extrinsic. There's a whole issue too about of asking people what their motive, what motivates them. We generally don't do that because of this idea of introspective illusion. Um, and so, but there, we do have this one data point in there that I really like. Uh, and again, I think Keegan might have pushed us to do this. Good work, Keegan. Um, which I found really interesting is where do scientists get their goals, which is more of like a, almost like a reporting their past behavior. Um, interesting, the key thing is they're not getting their goals from their organizations. Um, they're getting their goals from whatever whatever floats the rope, which is kind of a fun, interesting thing to know. Uh, one of the things we've been arguing in our work is we need to do more to get people to do goals collaboratively rather than making science communication individual. But this really suggests that people are choosing their science goals because they want to. And then the last question, I think this is the last question I'm gonna answer that SciPep asked us that I'm gonna to try to answer. Uh, what do we know about scientists' confidence to communicate? For me, so when I think word confidence, I think of the idea of self-efficacy. Um, I'm gonna argue though that that's just one, if you want somebody to do a behavior, their, ability, their perceived ability to do the behavior is just one driver of that. So I'm not just gonna tell you about self-efficacy. I'm gonna tell you about the full range of, of, of or, or full or more complete range of potential beliefs that someone could have. Um, particularly, uh, if you want somebody to do a behavior, they need to see the behavior as beneficial and not risky. And what we see is that generally speaking, our sample, which is to say, a sample that leans pretty heavily on basic scientists, see communication as beneficial and they're not particularly worried about it hurting them. Um, yeah, they're a little, they're a little more uh, that those green questions are the norms questions. Do they, so which is another key driver of behavior. Often, we haven't found that to be true in, in science communication work or in our science communication work. But generally speaking, scientists aren't that worried about what their colleagues think and they don't, um, and they're, yeah, we haven't found that norms matter as much. And those are sort of in the middle. And then, so in terms of self-efficacy, yeah, they feel, and so this is the thing where we need to break down self-efficacy is, so there's the skills, I have the skills, and they're pretty high on that front, four out of a five point scale. On the other hand, this other one, part of self-efficacy is sometimes called perceived behavioral control or agency. Do I have the resources? Not as high. And so there's an, often a concern about um, resources. Um, and in terms of, do these correlate with basic science? Not really, not so much. Um, and then fine, so the last thing I'm gonna say is, so when I, the more I think about this and I think about goals, and the thing that we've been realizing, I think, that we didn't get at in this survey is, I think they have goals, Scient basic scientists have goals, or people who do tend to do more basic research have goals, but I think their goals are more general. And so it's like, I wanna increase trust within society, whereas maybe a scientist working in an ecological site, I wanna increase trust in this specific place. And so I think one of the things that we can think about this is like overall, uh, diplomat versus trade services, right? If you're in an applied field, you can think of you have these more specific needs, but the goals are still the same. They're just at a different level of of, um, of magnitude. And so I'm going to stop there. And thank you so much for, for letting me share. All right. Thank you, everyone. That was really excellent. I'm going to ask everyone to turn on their cameras so we can join in on discussion together. Um, I'm going to start off just with a couple of sort of 
about your research questions that keep popping up in the Q&A. Um, one of the questions we saw in Chris Volpe's data that he included social scientists as part of his work. The question is for Sarah, John, and Todd, did you also reach out to social scientists in your data? So there's a sort of questions about comparability of what you looked at. Is that yes, no? I have an easy, yeah, I have a quick answer. I, we did not include in the sample, I, in the data I presented, we did not include social scientists. And I think I responded in the Q&A as well. Oh, we can't hear John. We did have 2016 data that's in the book and that we've reported elsewhere. We had uh, social scientists, um, political scientists particularly. Um, they're, yeah, they're a little more eager to communicate. But yeah, in this project, no, we're focused on basic science, natural, basic sciences and the natural and physical sciences. And we, in, we included social um, in the AAU uh, data uh, sample because uh, I get, and I guess part of that process was we were, the strategy was a random, a random sampling of uh, departments identified as STEM uh, fields by the NSF. And so those were part of it. Great. And then this is a question also about sort of research. It was prompted by some of Olivia's comments. And this this observation we've seen, and I think data on it too, that there are more women in applied sciences than they are in less in more basic sciences. And so there was this question of like, did you then dig in a little bit deeper to see if some of distinctions, if any, might be driven by um, as Chris was pointing out earlier, that maybe it's not about basic or applied, but process versus outcome, which may be keyed into other identities and characteristics of scientists. Big question, anybody wanna jump in there? Yeah, I mean, we always spend a lot of time looking at demographics and these kind of things. And generally speaking, we don't, in those little relationships, there's not big things. I think people overestimate how important demographics are to these things, <clears throat> especially after you start thinking about some of the, you know, the, what do they believe, what do they feel? And even if you look at what do they believe and what do they feel questions, those don't very, very much by demographics. And so demographics to me are a little bit of, I mean, so they matter, of course, but they're not the most important thing. Also, when you think about behavior change and trying to like get scientists to make different choices, you can't actually affect their demographics. Those exist a priori. And so um, we tend to focus on the things we can actually affect. Um, but generally speaking, we just don't find big, big relationships on demographics for any variable we look at. Any other thoughts? So I, I think this is also related to a, a question in the chat about um, about making science communication more inclusive and diverse, especially given the predominant older white men surveyed. So I just wanna address the last part of that question, um, simply because actually I, I generally expect more women to answer or more people identify as female to answer surveys, um, but this is quite different, right? For uh, a scientist sample. And so it's not that we sought or that we set out to only survey older white men. It's This is what falls out. Right, in the sample, you try as much as you can to, to include folks in the sample. Um, but this tends to be what falls out, you know, partly because of the, the makeup of scientists in the US. Yes, there are more men, right? Um, and so the other thing I wanted to mention was that I, uh, we do have data about demographics and I think I, I would support what John has just mentioned, but also I tried to answer the questions about basic and applied, right? So I really wasn't looking too closely at demographics when I looked at some of these questions and, and tried to focus on this kind of basic applied distinction um, that we are we're talking about in, in the next few days. Great, thanks. So I'm gonna dig in a little bit more, um, not so much on demographics, but on identity. And Olivia, you raised this in your, um, in your talk specifically. So we have all this data so does it matter how scientists identify their research, research, basic, applied, or mixture? And you started to answer that question when it comes to supporting them to be more effective communicators. And I'm going to add a little bit to that um, question. If Chris's conjecture is correct, that basic scientists tend to be the ones that are more joy process minded, will our instincts to communicate that joy put them at odds with audiences 
maybe many, maybe some, who so hold some skepticism about research in general, um, particularly if they belong to groups, communities who have been harmed by science. Would the identity as a basic scientist or process-minded scientist come into play in that place? Uh, that's a great question. I think given, given both my own observations and the excellent work that my fellow panelists have presented, it seems to me that what is far more important when we talk about how we can be supporting people and what we can be providing for scientists who want to do communication is in really both finding out from them and helping them formulate their goals, right? Because Yes, and those may be somewhat, you know, in, in variance based on uh, basic versus applied, but they're also going to vary based on a lot of other characteristics, including some of the ones I mentioned and have observed around identity, past experience, uh, you know, doing communication, etc. So I think, I think it's worth being aware that this may be part of it, but, you know, a lot of this really seems to be talking about where are people at and what they want to communicate and how they want to communicate it and to whom? And so as a, you know, psychom trainer, primarily by profession, I feel my duty is both to nudge some of those goals if they seem a little bit information deficit model E or otherwise kind of naive, um, but also to try to support the different ways that one can communicate based on the goals that people have and whom they're trying to reach. Great. And Todd, I wanted to bring in some of your thoughts here too, because you also were digging into, and Sarah also, um, how scientists perceive themselves in their being equipped in communicating about, the, about science in general. Would you share some thoughts? I could, I could go first. Um, so I mean, from, from the data we collected, what appears to me is that some of what we're seeing is, and, and it gets at some of these relational, uh, relational um, objectives that they have in terms of how they want to connect to people, how they think about connection. And to me, that seems like, and, it, and it's kind of, it's kind of at odds a little bit. Cause like we see that, you know, getting youth excited, gaining interest, gaining interest and excitement. But then when it comes to hearing what others think and that kind of relational aspect, and I know there's a whole session session on uh, relevance and how we, and how we define that. Um, but I think that's, you know, kind of connecting dots between what uh, Olivia uh, and John were just talking about, about helping to identify these goals. Um, I think is, I think is really important. So yeah, I think that's, that's kind of where I'm at on that. Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, that question for us, I am skilled, right, at communicating um, was sort of an add-on question. We weren't as interested, primarily because these that was not the primary focus of this data collection. Um, as I mentioned, I think it's part of a study on, on humor as a strategy for science communication and humor on social media in particular, which is why the questions are about social. Um, and so, you know, we don't have as much sort of directed data around agency, for example, uh, as, as John had. Are basic scientists funnier? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking there. Um, so my, my question, I, I guess, comes down to this, and I'll turn to John and Chris in this, is so are there benefits or disadvantages to bucketing scientists as basic or applied when we start to think about supporting their communication interests and needs? Um, John, you had mentioned that basic scientists, there may to be a tendency for their goals to be more general rather than specific. Um, so could if you could start sort of build from there, maybe. Yeah, that's a great, great way to get at this. So I think, so the way I think about this is like, if I have a group of applied scientists who have a real challenge, there's a specific group of people that they're interacting with and they want to build better relationships with them and, and, and help them consider scientific evidence and get gather insights from, from that group. To me, there's tr awesome training that could be really specific to that 
building a relationship, have that long-term relationship. In fact, our colleague Sarah Yeo, STEM Ambassadors Program, you know, it's kind of built around a little bit of that idea. But there's, a, but so yeah, and so if I had a group of a scientists and they really knew at that point um, what they wanted to accomplish and they had a very specific audience and a very specific goal, I'd want to help them train them to achieve that specific extent. Now, on the other hand, you could be an applied scientist where you don't haven't identified yet that that yet, and so maybe it works at that point. It makes sense to have sort of training with basic scientists where you're still in the process of like figuring out um, what you want to accomplish. And I really loved Olivia's. Um, cartoon with that sort of like experience thing like that that speaks to me like yeah that's that's right like when you first get into it yeah i want to do this thing and then like oh no no i'm and you get to that point where you figure out what it is you want to accomplish and so for me that it's so yeah so there might be a that bucketing might make sense in some contexts but again i want to organize and train around do you have a goal already can i help you achieve that if you have don't have a goal already can we start training that's like, well, let's figure out your goal before we start trying to teach you. I could teach you a whole bunch of social media skills, but if it turns out social media isn't what you need, I shouldn't have been focusing on those skills. And Chris, like, I want to turn it to you. You had this conjecture, like you said, maybe not basic apply, but maybe process versus outcome. And could you dig in a little bit more about why that would be your takeaway? Yeah, I, I'm I'm leaning that way, um, but it's by no means conclusive. I would say we're we're in the very early stages of looking at that seriously, kind of as a group. But I do think process versus payoff minded might be just a more useful way of delineating. I mean, the motivate my personal motivation for for caring. Why do you even care? Is it sort of it, it's establishing an initial condition, right? In terms of where someone is sort of entering the dialogue. And so, uh, you know, whether one intends to be more process minded or payoff minded, you know, potentially can predict certain certain intuitive decisions that are made and certain strengths and certain weaknesses and certain congruencies and certain discongruencies with particular audiences. One's not necessarily better than the other. And, um, you know, uh, one can come away with, uh, you know, you want to be a payoff minded person when talking to the public and not a process minded. Um, I wouldn't want anyone to come away from that uh, because while at a strategic level, people who are payoff mind, scientists who are more payoff minded, um, you know, may align ultimately with the way they think about things with the more of the public, the process minded folks, the joy folks at a tactical level, may have a whole lot more enthusiasm and glee in sharing the experience of what they do every day. And I think, and as I look at um, Sarah, John, and Todd's data, I actually, I see some of that, that, uh, you know, from, with a, again, from a training point of view or someone who just wants to help scientists bridge the gap with the public, I find it be useful to know kind of where they're coming into the relationship from a more process minded place or a more payoff place. And I would go and argue, I think most people are a little bit of both. So one may tend to be more payoff minded in certain circumstances or certain aspects than others. So I don't want to um, overlook or oversimplify the nature of the problem. But I seem to think that that gets more to what one of the things we care about than the basic versus applied labels. And this might relate to one of the questions, just a follow up, Chris, that was submitted is they were wondering if you could share a practical example of what challenges may joy driven scientists may face when communicating with publics versus somebody who's more hope driven. Ah, great question. Okay. Um, million dollar, so I'll, I'll give a metaphorical answer and then I'll attempt to give a real example in real time. So metaphorically, so and th th I'll put on my marketing hat, take off my scientist hat. Um, you're trying to sell a red convertible. A payoff minded person sells the red convertible by telling the prospective, you know, customer, it's Friday, it's a beautiful day, 70 degrees, the Pacific Ocean's there, the sun side, you're driving your red convertible, there's no traffic and your hair is, you know, winds blowing through your hair. That's a hope payoff minded approach to making a persuasive argument. A joy process way of making a persuasive argument is lifting up the hood and saying, let me tell you how the engine works. And, and let me tell you about combustion. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not, I never sold cars, but my sense is, you know, one way works a lot more effectively in, in the transaction than the other. 
that's sort of the distinction between the two. I'm a climate trained scientist, not practicing, but was trained. And I would say, you know, a lot of the early climate arguments definitely were more process oriented than payoff. And that's where you find folks saying, but look at the data, look at the data. We're piling up the pile of data in support of this position is getting larger, 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 and it's having no effect on moving the needle. That's because that's a payoff argument. You're, you're arguing, you know, the, 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 the evidence that you're putting forth is from the fruit of the process of science. You're missing the point, which is, you know, at the end of the day, I, the audience who am skeptical, want to know science means hope. Where is the hope in your argument? Are you showing me this problem because you have a way of fixing it? Okay, maybe I'm interested in that, but otherwise you're delivering. So, so there's there's a difference there. I don't know if my real world example helps. I'll think on that. I can maybe follow up. Or if anybody else, I would love my esteemed colleagues throw out a, a great example. And there is a question also in the chat. This is from Jeannie. Sort of in her experience, Communication to basic of science can be elevated when the person doing the communicating is more passionate about their material. So if scientists set goals based on what is interesting to them or important to them, it feels like that's valuable when it comes to training or supporting them. So how do you think about this in the context of, of pushing for collaborative goal making? And Todd, are you raising your hand? Yes. Okay, Todd. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm raising it because I was looking through the comments and, and Claudia made, I think, one that's really insightful in the sense of um, how audience is involved and who these different audiences are. And, you know, I think what we're trying to do, you know, collectively is trying to, you know, much as as much as, you know, science communication research has done in, in trying to segment different audiences and understand um, how different communities think and engage, you know, the, what, um, what E presented on earlier today, I think, uh, you know, begins to get at that. Um, but it's this, uh, but it, it gets and we, you know, these conversations come up before it's like, does, does the goal setting come first or does, you know, the audience and, and, you know, where do those two meet and how do we, and how do we, part of this effort of what we're doing is trying to unpack science communication as this kind of monolithic thing to what Chris has been alluding to with science. There is no science or sciences and each of these different sciences holds different connections, thoughts, feelings among members of the public. And what are those, those might not be direct in terms of, you know, I think about chemistry, but what are those tangential, you know, experiences day to day that everyday publics can engage with? And I think that's, you know, and I think, um, uh, you know, where, where, where more and more research is needed, in my opinion, um, from this, especially with, um, you know, communities that we often, you know, try to oversample, for example, in a, in a survey, but you could gain much more insight from doing in-depth qualitative analysis, actually working and engaging and building and building essentially trusting relationships that hopefully can benefit um, moving forward. So maybe if we can do a little bit of a round robin question, what would you do next with this information? Like, what do you think would this information is useful for informing, whether it's new research questions or new training approaches? I, I'm really curious, where would you go from here with your, with the information we have in hand? Maybe we can start with John. Sure. Uh, I will tell you where we're going, I suppose. There's lots of things I want to do. But the big thing that we're we're trying to figure out is we, because of this goal thing has become so important to us, we've been trying to think, trying to find organizations who want to spend time with my colleagues and I really getting deep. Like, what is your goal? And then building out strategies to or goals, because there's always going to be several, and then building out strategies to achieve those goals. And so what we're trying, so it's almost like a practical thing is like, how do we have those conversations? What does a strategy, good strategy look like? How do we actually get support to implement those strategies? So that's, and so, and I put a thing in the chat about assets, this idea we've been playing, one of the things that we started to do this with support of Cavalier, it turns out, which, thank you. Um, one of the things that's come up that we weren't really thinking about at the initially is, is and it goes to this audience for goal or goal first, is thinking about, well, your goals are gonna be informed by your, what we think of as your assets. What audiences do you have access to? 
where are you? Who are you? What's your personal assets? Like who, what are, what are your skills? What are your access to, access to resources? What equipment, like, do you have a big telescope? Do you have an, a days at your, your university? What are the, What's the context in which you're operating and figuring out from that set of assets and your set of interests and, and your set of goals is, is like, what do we want to do? And so we're trying to figure out mechanisms to work with scientists to get to uh, groups of scientists to get to that point. Um, that's what we're really excited about is try to figure out how to do that more, how to do that better. And also how to study that, which is a, one thing to do it. It's another thing to figure out how to study that. Um. If I may jump in here. So I think to build on what John was saying, you know, and the work that John and, and colleagues are doing around goals and objectives um, is really important because I think one of the things that perhaps not, um, we should we might go from here, right? And you'll see this again tomorrow when we talk about a research agenda in that session, right? Thinking about what what goals um like, are those goals different, right? Are those goals and objectives different for basic science? Because I think this session is a little bit about like, are basic scientists and applied scientists different in some way? Um, I will, full disclosure, say I sort of lean toward um, John's position on this, where I don't necessarily think that they are super different, but maybe there are some differences in goals and objectives, perhaps, right? And um, what are those tactics used? And then I think there's there's research questions around what goals, objectives, tactics um, are effective, right, for accomplishing, like what tactics are effective for accomplishing those objectives and goals. So there's research to be done around that. Um, and I think, as I mentioned in my talk, you know, there some of these data bring to light that there might be trainings right, that maybe already exist. Uh, some of this we have mentioned a little bit, the STEM ambassador program, um, which is a program that I took over recently that tries to encourage scientists to build relationships with communities based on sort of the other hats they wear, right? Like Chris took off his scientist hat and put his marketing hat on and, you know, those are all the other hats that we wear. But also, you know, what trainings uh, can we imagine like could or, or should exist? And I'll, and I'll sort of leave it there before, um, before I give away everything from for tomorrow. Olivia, thoughts? Where would where would you go from this? Where would you go? Sure. I mean, you know, a large emphasis already in the kinds of SciComm workshops that my colleagues and I do is on asking the participants, what are your goals? Do think about those. Think about them more broadly than the sort of, you know, uh, I want people to know more about rocks, um, you know, and going back to, to genuine goals rather than just, just these. But I think, I think something that's a, occurring to me in this context is that it's probably valuable to share some of this kind of information with the participants as well, to be more transparent about, hey, there's a lot of research out there showing that there are sometimes these kinds of you know goals and these kinds of goals and as we think about audience because that's also an emphasis we put on during the workshops is what are your goals and then what do you think your desired audience or target audience's goals might be why might they actually want to talk with you and do those align you know so we have some of that but really sort of opening up this awareness for them and kind of um, being more explicit, let's say, in terms of like, are you thinking about it in this regard? And maybe, you know, again, with this process um, model or not, or, or payoff or some other realm where it's really trying to spell out for them, you know, what is this, what might this look like for you? And then where might there be a disconnect there with the audience that you want to reach out to? Thoughts, Todd? Where would you go? Yeah, um, I guess, uh, like John, I could say what we're doing uh, currently, um, and you know, generously supported by Cavalier. Uh, but and and I come from this. Uh, I think and I'm working on this uh, with my colleague at, at Madison Dietrich Schleifla, and is is thinking about uh, you know what we know from existing literature at all about how audiences um, in the US think about uh, many different basic science topics, but 
emerging technology more broadly. And part of that, our, our goal is to try to uh, communicate this to audiences of basic scientists on this is what public opinion research tells us about these um, specific issues. And I think to the whole, I, the whole point of, of, you know, goals, objectives, tactics is where, where we see that there's, um, you know, essentially these, these, these openings for, um, for dialogue or for engagement, um, trying to communicate with the scientific community, what we know from public opinion research are fruitful areas to look at. And I think, you know, in, in the, one of the previous talks, right, AI came up as, you know, this rapidly evolving issue. And I mean, there's many more of them, but like, we, we need, I mean, all these concepts that we're talking about, in terms of the basic versus applied dichotomy, in terms of if that even is a dichotomy, in terms of thinking about, um, you know, different types of science that's across the spectrum of, you know, from discovery to application, where where are those kind of sweet spots, so to speak, um, that we could inform um, these audiences with um, through, you know, findings of, you know, what public opinion tells us. Because um, it, it gets at this idea that, um, you know, we as science communicators want to synthesize, right, in a in a in a in a, in a clear and, and and effective way where the public stands on these issues, very specific issues related to these topics, and how we can, you know, essentially create, um, you know, resources and 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 um, and collaborations to to address this more more fruitfully. So for me, you know, the audience side of these questions um, is where my uh, focus is. Great, and Chris, I'm gonna ask you the same question, where would you go next? But I'm gonna couple it with something that came in the Q&A, which is also, do you have validated measures of joy and hope, like to measure these constructs within public audiences going forward, if that's one direction you might go forward? Okay, uh, yeah, so let me ask the first part and I'll take a stab at the second. So. Um, I have a selfish and unselfish what what I would do what I'd like to see happen next. The unselfish is I am a, 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 an absolute um, student of the Bestley Dudo School of Goals First and clarifying goals, um, and not just because if one has and I'm I'm oversimplifying their beliefs, so he can John can correct me, <laughs> but um, but you know you, you got to know your goal in order to get there. Uh, it's sort of hiking 101, um, and. Uh, that helps the individual, but clarifying goals also helps us as a community to synchronize and scale our efforts. I mean, until we as individuals or pockets or pods have clear idea of what we're trying to accomplish, how can we get in a room and figure out how to work and help each other? And there's clearly a need in society for us to do things at an individual level, yes, at a grassroots level, but also, at, you know, I think some structures need to be created within the scientific ecosystem to reaffirm the value proposition of science. It is not as obvious as it used to be to a lot of people. We heard from some folks this morning with questions that there are communities who just, you know, don't see the dots or don't connect the dots to say why this helps me. And in fact, I feel like the wheels of science and the technology are hurting me, you know? Um, so, so that's my unselfish. My, my selfish wish is with regards to payoff minded, process minded, like I said, it's a conjecture. There looks like something interesting there, sort of from an intellectual point of view. Does it really matter in the end? I don't know. Um, it, I would love to know if it did or if it doesn't. If it doesn't, great, intellectual curiosity, move on. If it does, I'd love to see how that can help um, trainers and supporters of science communicators play to their strengths and bolster their weaknesses. And as I said, I mean, whether you're payoff minded or process minded, I do think you have certain strengths and certain weaknesses in a typical engagement with the public. But we just, you know, we can speculate on what those might be. And there were some great questions asking, you know, about that, but we just don't know. So it would be great to pursue that. And then I'm sorry, you'll have to remind me the, the last part, the add on was. The add on was validated measures of joy and hope. How do we measure these constructs within our public audiences? Ah, great. All right. So if you really want to get serious and scientific about it, um, I'm going to defer to everyone else on the call here because they're serious social scientists. I'm a physical chemist pretending to be a marketer slash social scientist for a few hours a week. 
So we took a stab. I think there's interesting. Actually, the data set that revealed this, yes, the, was an instrument that we did in conjunction with Todd and John and others. So it was that was a serious piece of work. Um, but it was unexpected, and um, it would be very exciting to have someone return to that and and, and really delve into that in a, in, a, in a serious academic sort of way. Anyone want to take a quick stab at that? John, Todd, Tara? John? Oh, I thought that was a Sarah question. Sarah, you're more of an emotion researcher than I am. <laughs> um, I mean, so the way I get it, so I actually have a week, so I try to avoid this group like in my research because there's a whole work on on the role and how you measure people's for thinking um when i think about the types of hope versus um to me i get into belief the belief version of that which is do i think it's going to be useful do i think it's going to be enjoyable which so there's a equivalent of like so i can't communicate hope right like if i have a design a message of hope what does a message of hope look like a message of hope looks like i think i put this in the chat that's a message that talks about collective efficacy. It's a message that talks about um, we can do this thing. This thing's possible. It'll if we do it, it'll work. Like those are messages that are about. I want you to believe a thing that there's a benefit. But the and this is the thing about benefits is people like oh it, or beliefs. Sorry, is that people think it's sort of stale. But there's evaluations and feelings built into most of the beliefs. And so I tend to focus more on um, yeah. I, and from everything we find that communicating the benefits of things matters a lot um not just focus on oh, it's, everything's bad everything's risky everything's terrible like that's that's not going to get people to do things if you want people to do stuff they have to believe doing it that they have the ability to do it and that they that doing it will make a difference yeah, yeah i think I, I um i sort of take that discrete emotion perspective that john does it right this idea that you can ask people uh, you know using adjectives right hopeful encouraging things like this and ask people to rate that on a scale. Um, are those validated? That's hard to hard to say, right? Can people respond like, am I feeling angry or fearful? For the most part, I think that um, research shows that that is true, right? And so it doesn't seem likely to think that we wouldn't be able to do that for hope either. Uh, that said, hope is a maybe more complex emotion than anger or fear necessarily, which tend to be more basic discrete emotions. Hope tend to be amalg hope is sort of an amalgamation of different emotions, right? One can feel hopeful, but what does that actually mean, right? Is there some happiness within that? Is there are there other sort of, you know, affective type um, feelings associated with that? And so are there validated measures? Uh, no, but a lot of discrete emotion researchers you know, so I think about how we're going to validate that question, for example, right? How do you validate a measure of hope? Like, what is the, the metric by which you say, yes, somebody is absolutely feeling hopeful and they have answered this like scale, right? Um, and so, you know, thinking about what that might be um, is interesting, but I think we can get at some sense, right? With a, with a series of sort of just adjectives describing hope, right? Synonyms for it, um, get a sense of that at least. Chris. Yeah, it, it, great. Um, so Sarah, you're nominated. Go for it. Um, to turn to the audience with hope, I just want to also clarify something. Um, when we say, you know, when I'm here to report that the majority of Americans associate science with hope, I mean, that is the brand of hope, not what it should be. That is what it is today. That's really important. I don't want to, I want to separate that from the payoff process of the scientists and the communicators. Um, it explains a whole lot about the real world that we live in. What that means is it's a, it sounds like a great bumper sticker, science is hope, and it is. It's a good, it's not, it's a good brand. But it's telling us, it's a clue that, that Americans judge the value of science by what it produces, the payoff. Okay? So I'm here to just tell everybody, when you're, trying, when, when you're engaging you know, the typical public, and you want them to decide whether something's good science or bad science. I'm here to tell you they're not going to judge it based on the qualifications of the scientists, the methodology used, the amount of data, all of that process-oriented stuff. They're going to judge whether science is good or bad by the intended payoff. If they agree with that payoff, in other words, if that payoff outcome aligns with their beliefs and values, that's good science. 
And if it doesn't, that's bad science. And as consumers, they reserve the right to cherry pick from all kinds. There's no, oh, I got to be, I got to love all science or I got to not. So that's why terms like anti-science are really not constructive. They, they, there is no anti-science people. People cherry pick. Some people pick more than others, but they cherry pick what aligns with them. And that's what the science has hope at the end of the day is really telling us is that people are judging rightly or wrongly. I think as scientists, we, it makes us cringe a little bit, but that's how they're deciding whether something's good science or bad science by the intended outcome and whether they agree with it or not. End of story. I have a question about that outcome. So is outcome the hope that science produces something or that science makes you feel something? So could an outcome be that you feel more hopeful or you feel more curious or you feel more confident that the world is good because there's people out there who do knowledge, like want to learn and discover it and share it. Um, how do we dig into this question about what outcome minded means, what hopeful means? I mean, I, um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Well, no, I was going to say, I think some of that, you know, the idea of like feeling hopeful is to me fits into the BFFs thing, right? Beliefs, feelings, frames, it's a feeling that I want, but what is the sort of communication goal around that feeling hopeful, as John would say, to what end? Um, so I will let maybe John or Todd take over. Todd, you go first. <laughs> yeah, no, because I'm probably going to be a little different. Um, but I mean, to that point, Keegan, that you brought up, um, and this is why I think, you know, like what Chris has been describing is some of these, um, you know, more consumer oriented uh, tactics, right? But this idea, and, you know, I do this in my, in my undergraduate classes all the time. I have students like, what is science? Um, it, it's, the answers go all over the place. And, and to your point, it's like, is it, is it, is it the individuals doing science? Is it institutions that represent science? Is science this, this broader concept? And I think understanding those connections and how those relate, right? There's a lot, John's done work in trust, Sarah's done work in trust and how that operates. Um, but I, there, there's something there with unpacking the, the meanings as Chris has you know, done with these, with, with these kind of word associations, what that means and, 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 and how to go about that. And, and, like in a lot of research that is trying to get into validate scales like this, you need really good qualitative research um, and good qualitative research with the right types of uh, audiences. And that includes um, audiences from all different types of communities. And, you know, I think that's where, you know, validating a scale, uh, if we were to think of something more about emotional connections to science could come from. John, did you have thoughts? Just play at my my emotions oh, wheel. wheel. <laughs> I'm gonna pull it off the wall. I mean, there's just there's so hope is we get so focused on this emotion of hope as being like something. And I agree that when people like that's gonna be a thing, then we like, well, what do you when you think of science, what do you think? But if we go back to the like the idea of strategy, we think, what do we want to accomplish? What's the thing we want to happen in the world? We want people to consider evidence. We want people to can to to um to turn to science. I mean, for us, it's we want people to turn to science when faced with challenging problems. And so then I think, well, what makes that more likely? Well, they have to see the scientists as caring and competent, and honest and willing to listen. Well, and also they have to believe that it's going to be more beneficial than risky to turn to them. They have to believe that their colleagues and friends will think that that's okay. They have to believe that they have the ability to do that thing, to do whatever the behavior is. All, a lot of those things, hope is one emotion they're going to feel. And it's a great emotion. To me, that the benefit of really focusing on like making sure that, yeah, we're thinking in terms of hope, we're thinking in terms of benefits, is to get us to not, well, so what's the opposite of that? Would be communication that is designed to make people angry, design communication that's designed to make people feel fear, design communication that make me feel disgust or um, all these other negative emotions that doesn't really, that pushes people away from, there's a whole world in, in the emotions literature about approach and um, that's the opposite of approach emotions, but, um, and so like, it's a way of thinking like, well, what is the outcome we, ex what, given the behavior we want, what's the outcomes we expect to happen? And hope's sort of important in that, but I don't want to get, it's just one element of it. It's more broadly, we need to think about all, like, if I communicate in this way, if I communicate this thing, 
what are people, how are people going to experience that? What are they going to come to believe? What are they going to come to feel? How are they going to frame the issue as a result of the choices that we make? And we're going to make choices no matter what. And this is the other fun thing about strategy is you can choose to, I'm not going to be strategic. It makes me uncomfortable. People are still going to form beliefs, form emotions, frame issues. And so the strategic bit is like, let's do that on purpose, um, ethically, responsibly, carefully, reflexively. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's, uh, I worry we spoke like hope is when we've it's it's so important, but it's just one emotion of a whole bunch of discrete emotions of a whole bunch of potential outcomes. And so I worry we spend a lot of time on it. Great, thank you. So we're almost out of time. Um, Olivia, did you want to say something really quickly? Oh, sure. Just I think you know, when we talk about outcomes and what people care about in terms of how to whether they approve of sort of what the outcome of science is, I think we can get them more interested in the other aspects of science, the process through, as John was saying, what is at the heart of a lot of science communication of personalizing, of humanizing, of telling the stories of the people involved and the reasons they're going into it so that you know the public isn't imagining an agenda for them. And it's building a kind of trust and excitement that can lead to, to interest and uh, positive feelings around other aspects of science. Great. So as we wrap up, I'm going to ask one final question and give you a moment to think about it. But in entering this space where we're asking what is distinct about basic scientists that could be instructive for equipping them or um, empowering them to communicate about research, whether you've delved into this from a research question or you've delved into this from working um, like Olivia does with practitioners, what's resonated or surprised you the most when you asked that question or have been asked that question? Um, so think about that for a moment and then see if you've got a 30 second thought. What has surprised or resonated with you the most about this context? And I'm going to turn first to Todd, who looks really thoughtful there. I'm, uh... I'm thinking it took a really good question, Keegan. Um, so what has surprised me the most about conversations I've had within this thinking about the basic person? I mean, I think one thing, you know, and that's come out in, in some of the work that I think, you know, that, that Rose and Marissa have, have, have talked about and it's, it's been that are going to talk about I think, tomorrow. Um, but this idea that um, you know the the the, the concepts are, are like like yeah we can define it um, like we understand what it is and what it isn't but like um, it, it's hard not to see that the two are just part of part of a whole and you know one of the things you know that I've always thought and that's kind of always been on the back of my mind you know it really goes to this question of funding and funding for 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 basic science research right which is something that you know the government puts out statistics on they have basic they have applied research and the idea that there that um a going to what chris has been talking about that you know these terms you know basic fundamental discovery uh, applied research don't clearly resonate but within the scientific community even we see that there's you know, so there, there, there is discussion about, well, how, you know, how, how we are, how we're defining them, et cetera. And, you know, one of the things, and, and which is why I think this is, these conversations are so important is like, it, it, if these concepts aren't, aren't familiar and, um, you know, as, as data has, has uh, proved before, right. There's um, among the public writ large, there's, um, not necessarily consensus around where most of federal research dollars come from and you make the case about communicating basic science um you know how do you do that in a way um that that shows the importance and that shows right that taxpayer money is going towards something that is um you know relevant however that's defined right that, that'll be another 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 topic um but for me, it's it's been you know grappling with these distinctions, both in terms of how you know scientists think about them, but also really from you know the public side as well, and how and how and how to get at um, 
you know, unpacking these terms on a level that is um, more that I think the, that I think the public, you know, that doesn't have science on top of their mind, right, which most people don't, right, how to make those connections. And so for me, those are a lot of, I think, what I grapple with. Chris? Uh, repeat what Todd said, you know, let's not get caught up in the terminology. If you're, if you're self-identified as a basic scientist, don't have an inferiority complex. Don't go out of your way, which some basic scientists seem to do in my experience where they, you know, say what they're doing and then, but it has no practical purpose or it's not intending to have a, why say that? It adds nothing, uh, you know, to the public. You know, explorers are explorers. Focus on the exploration, period. And all those good words that people already sort of like to associate with science. And then at the end of the day, science communication is about, you know, answering the question with your audience. Why should I care? Why should I care what you're saying? That's the focus. Um, so, you know, the answer may be because this has, you know, this will save the universe. So you should care in that context. Or, you know, you should care because this is my personal story as a, a young scientist. And it's a personal story. As Olivia said, you you just got to find the scale, find the in. You know, that's sort of the art of, of what we what we do as science communicators. And and uh, every case is a little different and no one size fits all. But, you know, in that first 30 seconds, the audience is waiting to hear why should I care? And it doesn't have to be save the universe. It's not like Hollywood blockbusters. You don't have to, every sequel doesn't have to say more and more of the universe multiverse. That, no, personal interest stories are great too. Olivia, what stood out or resonated with you in this question about basic scientists and communication? I think two things. One is how much we can't agree about whether there's a difference or not, or maybe we all are, and we're just talking about the same thing in very different ways. And I actually think that's that's really fun because I'm learning a lot from how we're approaching it from different angles. Um, and then the other part is just that it strikes me that there's a real difference when we ask ourselves, is there a difference between basic scientists and applied scientists in you know, how they're communicating or how they're, we're helping them communicate versus is there a difference in communicating about basic science? And so that's another question that I think is really interesting to explore. John? Yeah, so I think the thing that we've been struggling with the most lately is everybody says they want to be strategic, but people also want to do the thing they want to do, mm -hmm. right? So if, you're doing, if you've been doing a public lecture for what number of years, you're going to want to keep doing the public lecture. And it might make sense. If you've been doing a, a podcast or you want to do a podcast, they want to do the podcast. And then maybe they like put some goals on, they sort of like slide some goals underneath it. But really the, just the challenge of, of, I mean, so a lot of it, Science scientists go in, do communication stuff because they enjoy it. It's satisfying. It feels good. And it's, that's fine. That's totally great. Except that they may not be, they may be having negative impacts. Who knows? They may be wasting resources. Who knows? They may be. And so there's just this idea of, of how much, how much people are willing to give lip service to being strategic. But when it really comes down to it, I'm really struggling with how do we get people to actually which essentially it's a be I'm, I have a behavior that I can't get people to do. I want the behavior I want people to do is be strategic, like think about their goals. And so that, in fact, that's how we study. But like, how do I like we're trying to figure out to figure out communication? Actually, like, what makes it more likely that you're going to be willing to do a strategic plan and implement a strategic plan and stick to your strategic plan? Like all these things that people give lip service to, but again, or that they give lip service to the idea of the science of science communication. But do they really want to read the books? Do they really want to? turn to the Sarahs and ask for help and pay the money that it costs to do that. It's tricky. I mean, we, we, it's, 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 it's hard, but that's what I've been spending my time worrying about. And I think, I'm not sure if that's a basic science thing, but it's definitely I'm spending a lot of time in the basic science world these days. And those, those challenges are my everyday challenges. That's what resonates with you. And Sarah, final thoughts as we wrap up. Yeah, I think uh, this was teed up really nicely. Uh, I think that my what was surprising to me is this idea that we still keep coming back right when we offer these like deficit model type goals. We still keep coming back to that, which sort of indicates to me that we have we have work. We have a lot of work to do in science communication that we haven't done 
as much of this as we maybe should, right? That these deficit models still keep coming up over and over as, well, I just want them to have information. I just want people to know about this. And then somehow magically, right? Attitudes will be better, things will change and so on. Um, so that's, maybe it shouldn't be surprising to me, but still is. Thank you. And with that, please join me in thanking this wonderful panel and all of the information they've shared with us. We're gonna take a short break and return um, with our next session on relevance or connection. So thank you everyone.